Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for this month's episode of Live from the Trevor Zoo. It's great to welcome you all to the zoo. We've been open to the public once again since July 13th and we've been thrilled with the response. We've put a number of new safety protocols in place, including mandatory mask wearing for everyone and a reservation system to guarantee social distancing for our visitors. And it's been working great. You can make your reservation on our website at www.trevorzoo.org. After coming to you live every week while we were closed, this is our first monthly live broadcast here on Facebook, and we'll be doing these shows once a month. I'm Matt Grosscup, and I graduated from Millbrook School in 2019. I'm currently studying environmental science at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I started working as a summer volunteer at the zoo when I was 13 years old, two years before I started attending Millbrook School. When I was a third former, or ninth grader, I became a zooey, and eventually a student curator, and then a head student curator my senior year or sixth form year. One of the highlights of my time here was my independent science research project, which I conducted with our Jeffrey Marmosets and Golden Lion Tamarins. Getting that opportunity was something I could have only experienced here at Millbrook. Today we're going to talk about one of our endangered species, the black and white rough lemur, and the three black and white lemurs who currently live here at the Trevor Zoo. Black and white rough lemurs are the largest of the lemur species. Active during the day and mainly living in the trees, they are native only to the island nation of Madagascar. And like all lemur species, they are critically endangered. In fact, lemurs are the most endangered mammals on earth. Just a reminder, please feel free to ask questions throughout today's episode. Just type them in the comments and we'll answer them towards the end of the show. Here at the Trevor Zoo, we currently have three black and white rough lemurs, Maki, Bombo, and their newborn son, Billy. In 1984, our former director, John O. Meggs, from Millbrook's class of 1965, and his wife, Jane, along with their children, took a sabbatical to the Jersey Zoo in the Channel Islands. One of the main purposes of that trip was to learn more about lemurs and bring back that knowledge to the Trevor Zoo. When John O. returned, we started with brown lemurs and red-fronted lemurs. Currently, the Trevor Zoo has ring-tailed lemurs and, of course, our subject today, black and white rough lemurs. In October of 1985, we received our first two black and white lemurs on a breeding loan from the San Diego Zoo. Ixion was the male and Baby, aka Mama, was the female. They had their first litter in May of 1986 and a boy and a girl and another set of boys in April of 1987. Then in April of 1989, they had four babies, including a female named Fang. She was with us for almost 20 years. In 2004, Patches arrived from the Mick Grove Zoo. Born in 1983, he died in 2013 at a ripe old age of 30. Much of his time here was spent with Fidget, who came to us in 2008 from the Ellen Trout Zoo. She passed away in 2017. Bombo, our current male, was born in 2012 and came to us in 2014 from the Binder Park Zoo in Battle Creek, Michigan. His mate, Maki, whose name means lemur in French, was born in 2016 at Audubon Zoo in New Orleans. They have been together here since 2018. On April 11th of this year, they had their first offspring, a boy we have named Billy. It's been more than 20 years since we've had a black and white lemur baby at the Trevor Zoo. Maki was a natural mom and looked after her newborn with no help from the zoo staff. Billy has grown up quickly and he's already almost as big as his parents. We hope you will come to the Trevor Zoo soon to see him. And here are some more facts about black and white lemurs. This visually striking species hails from the tropical forests of eastern Madagascar, where its thick fur is well suited to the wet, sometimes chilly environment of the rainforest canopy. As their name suggests, black and white rough lemurs have black and white bodies. Not all individuals have the same black and white markings, but their hands, feet, tails, faces, and heads are typically black with a distinctive white ruff around their necks. In some individuals, patches of white can appear yellowish. They have bright yellow eyes. Black and white rough lemurs can reach 20 to 22 inches in body length and an additional 24 to 26 inches in tail length. Adults weigh between six and 10 pounds. As is common with lemur species, black and white rough lemurs have an array of vocalizations they use to communicate. Rough lemur families are highly vocal, and their loud calls can be heard up to a half mile away. As a primarily arboreal and quadrupedal species, they often walk, run, and leap from branch to branch. 
They are also adept at suspending from their feet to help reach ripe fruit hanging from the tree branches. In the wild, they are primarily frugivores, fruit eaters, but will also eat a variety of seeds, leaves, and nectar, which they are able to reach with their long tongues. Black and white rough lemurs are also known as the world's largest pollinators due to their mutualistic relationship with the traveler's tree, also known as the traveler's palm. They have the unique ability among pollinators to open the tree's flowers. While the lemurs benefit by eating the nectar within the flowers, the tree benefits from the pollination that occurs when the pollen sticks to the lemurs' faces and gets transported to the next tree. Their social structure consists of small family groups, typically between two and five individuals. Female rough lemurs give birth to litters of infants after a 90 to 120 day gestation period. Unlike other lemurs whose infants cling to their bellies or backs, rough lemurs park their infants in nests while foraging. Mothers can have as many as six infants at a time, although litters of two to four are the most common. Young stay in the nest while the female forages until they are more independent. When a female needs to travel with her young, she carries them in her mouth, rather than on her belly, as is common in most other lemur species. Young become independent at about four months and reach maturity around 20 months. In their native Madagascar, the breeding season is between May and June. In North American zoos, their breeding season is in December and January. Black and white rough lemurs are a largely diurnal species. They are primarily active during the day, especially in the morning and late afternoon. Black and white rough lemurs are thought to live an average of 19 years in the wild, sometimes longer in human care. As we said, patches live to be 30 years old here at the Trevor Zoo. All right, so let's check out our lemur exhibit and what we do to care for them. All right, welcome to our tropical kitchen. This is where we make the diets for the animals that live upstairs in tropical, as well as the otters that live just outside this building. Here we have an example of two black and white lemur diets. This is their pre-breakfast snack. As you can see, it has kale, a dried plum or prune, um, and it has these biscuits in it. And these biscuits are really important to their diet. They contain vital vitamins and minerals as well as high fiber because that's what lemurs require. And another diet would be more of their morning diet uh, later in the morning. It contains a mix of fruits and vegetables to keep their um, diet varied as it would be in the wild. And as you can see, we also give the biscuits for them. And in these fridges where we keep the ingredients and um, diets for the animals. And I think we're ready to go upstairs and feed the animals. So let's go upstairs. Got to put our mask on for this stuff. All right, let's go. Or actually, we're just taking this one. <laughs> OK, here we are at the black and white rough lemur exhibit. Um, we can just go inside. And as you can see, masks are required in this uh, exhibit because they are primates and we're not sure exactly how they react to any um, like coronavirus. Or, and it's locked. There we go. And we're in. And now we have to start the process of shifting them over into different spaces because they are protected contact species, meaning that we actually don't go in with them because they do have very sharp teeth. All right, let's see if we can, we can put her down there. Let's try to get some movement outside. Oops, sorry. I can't tell. Oh, we still have one in there. Come on, guys. As you can see, they're very intelligent, and they know that they're going to get fed. They can also see this food. And I can try to give them a little to, whoops, try to coax them in here. And. There we go. We're all set. So they still have act. Oh. How did you? I have no idea. Oh, right. As you can see, they're very good at opening doors. And this is why we have to shift them like this. Come on. All right. So this takes a second sometimes. But as you can see, they really want their food. And they still have access to outside. So they still have plenty of space. Bamba, want to come in? Bamba, look. Oh, yummy. Oh, that looks delicious. Do you want to come over here? See, I don't want to let them out. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, look at this. 
Sometimes it like, takes a little convincing with Bombo. Here, you can have your, you can have a little, little treat. Bombo, yeah. Oh, <laughs> there he is. All right, Bombo, come on. Sometimes he just needs, oh, here we go. Come on, Bombo, there we go, okay. One thing I did forget to do is put this door. <laughs> now he's in there and we're all ready to go. Okay, you can just put the tag up there for now and make sure this is nice and shut and we can head in. All right, I actually do need to grab this compost bucket and the sawdust. All right. So here we are in the main inside portion of the black and white rough lemur exhibit. And what we're going to start doing is collecting the old bowls. So this bowl. All right. And they have some enrichment items in here right now. So they do have some enrichment items in here right now. For instance, this container that are supposed to have these biscuits in them. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to encourage natural behaviors, such as manipulation, foraging, to just keep them active throughout the day. All right. We just got to do some poop scooping. And since they have so much outdoor time during the summer, they really don't come inside that often because they really do like being outside. So there's usually not too much to do in here. So, oh, there's the other bowl. So after doing that, oh, right, we have a little bit more. All right. So after poop scooping, we just need to put some more sawdust down. And the reason we have sawdust in here is one, it's really good at absorbing liquids. And two, there is a concrete floor in here, so we like to keep it nice and soft for their feet. <laughs> and it actually ends up being really nice for them because they play, play with it, throw it around. And usually, I just do that. And, and generally they're pretty good at spreading it around themselves. Sometimes it takes a little second to see all the stuff I need to get in here. But now it looks pretty clean. Just spread it around a little bit more. We're looking pretty good. All right. And now we're going to put these diets around the exhibit. One over there, maybe one in the branching, one up here. And we like to spread them out so there's not a lot of competition over the food because they can get a little bit jittery with each other, especially when it comes to food. But that's just them being lemurs. All right, I think we're pretty much done in here. So we have to let them back in so they can eat. <laughs> Just gonna close this door. It's a tight squeeze in here sometimes. And lock it. And then they're all set to come out. I didn't forget about you, Bomba. And you're all set. And now, Since they're inside, we have access to their outdoor exhibit while they're busy eating. So we would bring this compost bucket to the compost and bring these down to the kitchen to clean. And I think we're ready to head outside soon to clean their outdoor exhibit.
All right, here we are in our uh, outdoor lemur areas, um, and I have all my essentials, my compost bucket, my key, and some craisins to give them some shade. So let's head this way. And basically, as I said before, the black and white lemurs are a protected contact species, which means that staff is not able to go in with them because they do have very sharp teeth. Um, but the ringtails, however, are not a protected contact species. They are right here. And they're very curious for these craisins. Maybe I'll give some to you after, guys. <laughs> All right. So first, we're going to take this and lock that, creating an airlock, though we don't particularly need it because the lemurs are locked in. All right. We're still going to do it just to maintain habit. Anyway, here are some of our, uh, our, our system of shift doors. And this is how we make sure that we know where the animals are and we shift them into different spaces. As you can see, they are all closed right now, so that means they cannot get to us. All right, so we're going to head in with our compost bucket. OK. This is the outdoor portion of the black and white lemur exhibit. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is something very similar to what I did inside. Boop scooper. <laughs> and there's, as you can see, there's usually quite a bit more out here because they love to spend all their time outside in the summer. And in the summer, they can spend all their time outside because, you know, it's warm like it would be in their native home of Madagascar. But in the winter, per se, they can't necessarily do that. Maybe if it's a little warmer one day or it's really sunny, they can come outside. But that's about it, because it's not really what they're made for. Um, but I'm looking around. There's quite a, they really do most of their stuff out here. I'll try to get some of this up. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and it, collects very quickly, but as you can see, we do try to dig diligently stay on top of the cleaning of all our exhibits. The other thing you'll see out here is a lot of perching and roping, a lot of trees. And the reason we do that is because black and white lemurs are primarily an arboreal species, which means they live up in the trees in Madagascar, compared to the ringtails over there, which spend much more time on the ground. So by giving them all these ropes and tree branches and such, they have a lot more potential to experience that same kind of behavior that they would in the wild. And our director, Dr. T, is very good at finding these old trees to reuse them for our exhibits to make it as natural as possible for them. And we do rearrange this sometimes <laughs> and uh, to just kind of keep them having a more unique situation so it doesn't always stay the same. Um, as you can see, there's a variety of textures too so they can feel. Okay, this is much more rough, this is smooth, you know, some good stuff. And you can also see stuff like this giant <laughs> um, hamster wheel and basket. Um, they're, again, more enrichment um, for them to exhibit those natural behaviors of manipulation. Or This is just for fun, I think, <laughs> because it's just for them to have fun. Anyway, I'm going to do some final scoops. Oh, all right. I think it's a little dry overnight. All right. And I think we're about ready to go outside. You know what? I'm going to grab this. Oh, there's a little more. See, it's a little hard to see sometimes. All right. And I'm also going to grab this bamboo, which was also definitely given to them as enrichment. But, you know, it seems like they're done with it. So we're going to bring it out. OK. Now, how do I get outside? I guess I'll just go under here. All right. I'll just put it here for now. All right. 
and we have these screws in. And now what I'm gonna do is close this. And so now would be a time to let them out <laughs> and see if they come. Let's get this untangled. No, this is the right one. And they have these tags to tell us exactly where this leads to. So this would be their main exhibit. All right, and right there. Come on out, guys. <laughs> and so I'm going to take this with me. And put this lock back on. OK. And now would be a time. I can, first, I can give them treats. This is the little baby Billy right here. I'll move this off to the side. Let's see if they want any treats. All right, craisins, guys. Oh, man. Bombo's excited. Do you want some? Oh, yummy. Hey, mister. They're so cute. Maki, do you want some? Oh, oh, the baby really wants some. This is Billy, our new baby this spring, or summer too, I guess, at the Trevor Zoo with Dad Bombo and Mom Maki. He is very, very intent on getting all the craisins. But this would be a great time um, that I would lock them outside and then I would go in and clean their indoor keeper area where they were when I was cleaning the, um, the indoor exhibit. And that's when I would do their water and kind of just clean out that area to make sure it's all nice in them, for them. Because some of them like to sleep in there. Wow, you really are gung-ho for these. Oh man, see, they can get a little bit, a little bit playful with each other. Billy, you have to let your parents have some. I'll keep you distracted. Bamba, do you want one? <laughs> anyway, classic little boy. <laughs> That's what he is. <laughs> Always wanting attention. He's great, though. We're very happy to have him at the Trevor Zoo. <laughs> yeah, and you can actually see just a little tidbit. You can see how similar their hands are to ours. They even have like the, the pads like we have the, the, where there's no hair on the on palms. They have that little thumb. As you can see, he's grown up so much. He's almost the size of his parents. <laughs> Since we've had lemurs at the zoo, we have been participating in their conservation program, which is now managed as an AZA species survival plan. The black and white rough lemur is critically endangered in Madagascar, primarily due to hunting and habitat loss and fragmentation. Threats include slash and burn agriculture and illegal logging and mining. But there are a number of organizations that are working to help save the lemurs. Let's have a look. Here we are on the website of the Lemur Conservation F Foundation in Florida. The chairman of the board, Scott Revere, is actually a graduate of Millbrook from the class of 1971. All right, so let's look at some information about lemurs. One thing to note is that um, we're looking at some information that says lemurs are persimians, and that's actually a really important classification of lemurs because it basically sets them apart from other monkeys, I mean, other animals that are uh, under primates, such as monkeys, apes, and uh, humans. Um, but basically, it means they're pretty different. Um, they're actually the earliest link to extinct primates because they have very... Um, uh, interesting features that those extinct primates would have that maybe other monkeys would not have. Um, lemurs are also a very good um, example of isolated evolution for that exact reason. Um, they're very different from other primates um, because they actually split away with the island of Madagascar about 60 million years ago. Um, so they exhibit features that other primates do not exhibit. And another important part that this website shows is that captive lemur populations are very important for the survival of wild lemur populations because they provide a 
genetic safety net for those wildly lemur populations. Because if something were to happen to those high risk populations, especially lemurs like black and white rough lemurs that are critically endangered, um, that captive population would be a great um, fallback for inputting those individuals into the wild. And that leads us right into our next website, madagascarfloraandfauna.org. They have a program called the Back to the Wild program, especially for black and white rough lemurs, but other endangered and critically endangered um, lemurs. So this program is to reintroduce certain individuals back into the wild, especially at this natural reserve called the Betampona Natural Reserve in Northwest Madagascar. So naturally, uh, black and white rough lemurs would not live there, but it was actually a really great place to put black and white rough lemurs because it's a really ideal habitat for them. The one issue is that it's surrounded by a lot of land that is used for agriculture, meaning that lemurs cannot live there. There's not that rainforest habitat, that arboreal habitat that they require. Um, so that means that the lemurs actually won't cross over into the farmland. Um, and that poses a very interesting um, set of problems for lemurs because it puts them into a position that they will inbreed with each other and create a not genetically diverse uh, pool of individuals. So from the Back to the Wild program, a reintroduction of individuals into the wild can reinvigorate that uh, genetic pool of wild lemurs in the, in the Betampona Natural Reserve. And the situation that the Betampona um, Natural Reserve faces is very much um, similar to uh, situations that animals in the Amazon and Indonesian rainforests face with farming and agriculture taking away vast majority of their natural habitat. All right, as I said, a lot of their natural habitat is has been destroyed and there are estimates between 80% to 90% of Madagascar's natural rainforest has been deforested for agriculture. So potentially only 10% of that natural rainforest is left for lemurs like black and white rough lemurs to habitat. Um, so along with that 80, that 80 to 90% drop in natural habitat, along with that 80 to 90% natural habitat loss, over the past 30 years, the black and white rough lemur has lost about 80% of its population. So when we're looking here as it, at its current range, so this is the island of Madagascar here. So this doesn't highlight the Betampona Reserve, which would be somewhere up here in the Northwest. But this is where they live naturally in the um, Eastern coast of Madagascar. As you can see, it's such isolated areas for them to live in, which contributes to that, pop that itch issue of um, uh, inbreeding within the populations as such. But their historic range would really um, stretch from all the way up here in the northeast all the way down this eastern coast to basically where it cuts off down here. But this should all be highlighted in red for their historic range. All right, so for more information about lemurs, if you're interested, check out the links to these websites in the show's description. Um, and, and there's many more online resource, resources for you to check out as well. Okay, so let's hear your questions, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. If you have any questions about lemurs or anything else at the zoo, just go ahead and ask in the comments here. All right, so Charlotte asks, do the males care for the babies as well, and how is Bombo as a dad? So... It's kind of interesting because within the first six weeks of the baby's life during the infancy, the males don't really have much contact with the babies at all. The females are pretty much the sole providers of food and care for the babies. But after that six months is up, or six weeks, sorry, after that six weeks is up, the females often move the babies to communal nests and that's when the males will begin to have initial contact with the babies, trying to socialize them a little bit more, um, and they will also start caring for them a bit. And so that kind of connects to Bombo at the moment, who is starting to interact a lot more with the baby. Um, so there's a lot of rough housing we're seeing, which is really good um, as a socialization tactic. 
um, so that they'll have those that, that the baby will have that behavior um, and behaviors like that in the future. So Bombo is doing a really good job as a dad at this point. All right. Now, Augie, age four, would like to know, how do they keep their balance in the trees? All right, so they have a variety of tactics of keeping their balance. Um, so one is their tails. So they use their tails almost like a cat would, um, moving it around um, as they are jumping through the branches, um, trying to offset their weight um, so that their balance is kept on that uh, main branch. Um, the other thing that uh, they use is similar to humans, they have inner, their inner ears help with their balance. So like the inner ear fluid um, will move around so that their body will be able to tell kind of subconsciously where to adjust their weight. Um, and then the final thing they use um, are, of course, their hands and feet, which are really designed for uh, life in the trees. It's for arboreal life. Um, so they have those thumbs, those bare uh, hand pads to really grasp on to the tree branches. Um, and it keeps them very agile and very strong while they're jumping through the trees. All right, that seems to be it for the questions. So if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd like to remind you all that you can view all of our previous episodes of Live from the Trevor Zoo on our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com forward slash Trevor Zoo Millbrook. And you can also watch our streaming cameras throughout the zoo 24 hours a day at www.millbrook.org forward slash Trevor Zoo Live. Thanks for spending part of your Wednesday with us. If you're in the area, please come visit us in person. It's easy to make a reservation at our website which is www.trevorzoo.org. We'll see you back here live from the Trevor Zoo next month. Thanks for watching, be well, and see you soon.